Recently, I picked up a book on Jewish holy days and uh, found it so fascinating, I'd like to share some of the author's insights with you today. The book is entitled, The Days of Awe. Now, we're not offering this book on our program. It's a book uh, only uh, through Jewish sources, available only through Jewish sources. But I'd like to read some of the things this author, uh, Joseph Stern, has to say about the Days of Awe, that is the 10 dates uh, of the autumn festivals, and uh, share with you what I call contemplating the Days of Awe. Gary Stearman is here to discuss what I think is really a fascinating <coughs> study. It is, and by the way, this article uh, <clears throat> by J.R. appears in our January 1998 Prophecy in the News, a lead article. I think you'll want to uh, digest this at your leisure. When we talk about uh, uh, Jewish holidays, J.R., we're talking about symbols, metaphors, and types that are of great use to Christian worshipers because God operates through these types and symbols. Uh, even though you may not, in fact, uh, regularly practice anything on Rosh Hashanah, uh, it still remains a type and a symbol of the days of awe, and the days of awe corresponding, of course, to the exodus from Egypt and also to the great tribulation period yet to come. You know, these holy days, or Jewish holidays, were established 3,500 years ago when God gave Moses the law, or the, uh, the covenant called the law. And here on page 62 of the book, The Days of Awe, Joseph Stern writes about a microcosm of world history. He says, just as the head serves as a microcosm of the entire body containing the sensory components that control the most bodily functions, so too the day of Rosh Hashanah in itself represents the entire Jewish calendar year in miniature, and by extension, all world history. Gary, let's talk mm -hmm. about the months uh, mm -hmm. th for a few moments. It, it appears that <clears throat> the first seven mm -hmm. months of the Jewish calendar are literally a microcosm, mm. a miniaturization of world history. That's right. And, and by the way, when we talk about world history, we're not adopting the secular view at all. The secular view is very cloudy and confused and mixed up, particularly when you go back beyond uh, the days of Babylon. Uh, biblical, uh, the biblical philosophy of history, on the other hand, is based upon the days of creation, the lives of Adam and Eve, and then uh, their successors, the days of the patriarchs. Uh, in other words, when you talk about the history of the world from a biblical point of view, you're beginning to talk about a discrete time period, and yes. it's marked off in thousands of years. And these thousands of years roughly correspond to days, and I think that's what the, the rabbi is talking about that's here. That's right. So the Jewish calendar is laid out to be a prophetic overview of 7,000 years of human history, from the day of the, of the creation mm -hmm. of Adam until our present day, looking forward to the coming kingdom when Jesus Christ establishes the kingdom of heaven on planet Earth. Now, it's also interesting to note that these holidays of the Jews could not have foreseen human history, and yet they are laid out mm -hmm. as if they knew in advance mm -hmm. what was going to happen. Well, you know, that seems to tell us that the Lord laid out the holidays. Absolutely. Not the people of Israel themselves. By divine design. And this is the story of Adam and Eve, as you said, and the family tree. It is. That is listed in the Bible. In this Bible, it talks about these are the generations of Adam, and it goes on to spell them all the way from Adam down to Jesus mm -hmm. Christ. You can find it in the opening chapter of Matthew, again in Luke chapter 2. The genealogies from Adam down through Abraham, down through David to Jesus, and then, of course, from that day forward, we know that humanity is established back in mm -hmm. that ancient family tree. And in addition, the Hebrew calendar that marks off the holidays seems to be laid out in along the same pattern. For example, in March, April, you have the first month of the sacred calendar, the month Nisan. Uh -huh. And this starts marking off time that, that seems to relate to human history. And the first millennium. You recall Adam lived 930 years. That's pretty close to 1,000. Right. The first 1,000 years. And yet Passover, with the sacrifice of the animal, reminds us that God sacrificed the animals 
uh, to clothe Adam and Eve after the fall. So Passover is, uh, and, and the first month is basically an overview of the first millennium. Mm -hmm. Then the second millennium, the, the calendar month ER, um, is also a fascinating one, late April, early May. Uh, because it was in the second millennium that we had Noah and the flood. Mm -hmm. And it is in April that we have April showers bring May <laughs> flowers. And so what happens in the second month of the Jewish calendar year literally tells us the same story as we can see in the uh, second millennium. And then we have the third uh, month of the Hebrew calendar, the month Sivan. This would be May and early June. and. Uh, uh, we have a very interesting tradition concerning marriage mm -hmm. that goes back into this time period. Yeah, I think from which came the June bride concept. Mm -hmm. and that takes us back, of course, to Sinai and to the book of Exodus where God married Israel. Happened 2,500 years after uh, the creation of Adam. And uh, so we have this third day, in the middle of the third day, the third millennium, we have the marriage. It corresponds to June and the June bride. The fourth millennium, the fourth month of the Jewish calendar, Tammuz, late uh, June and early July. And in this month, uh, we have the, uh, I guess we could say, a period of apostasy, uh, kind of commemorating the golden calf and subsequent apostasies. Yes. It is said that on, in the 17th day of that month, uh, Israel was caught with the golden calf. Right. In this fourth month, we have God's judgment upon the chosen people. In the fourth millennium, we have the Assyrian captivity, the Babylonian captivity. We see the same thing happening. Mm. And so each month appears to be an overview of each millennium, which brings us to the fifth month. Yeah, okay? The month of, which by the way is uh, very dark. It's marked by the darkest day in the calendar, Tisha B'Av, the ninth of Av, the day of calamity and catastrophe, J.R. Mm -hmm. You know, this dark time certainly describes Israel's suffering during the Assyrian captivity in 722 B.C., the Babylonian captivity in 606 B.C., and then the other captivities and the problems of the Romans mm -hmm. who came, and, and finally the dispersion of the Jews in 132 A.D. We're talking about this dark time here between uh, the 17th of Tammuz and the 9th of Av. And it was in that fifth month that the Jews say that Messiah should be born on the 9th of Av. Well, this is the fifth month, and we're talking about the fifth millennium and Bethlehem. Absolutely. And, and he came in the fifth millennium. Messiah mm -hmm. uh, came, and you know, in a, in a way, to kind of paraphrase, uh, in the tale of two cities, it was the best of times, it was the worst of times. It was time when Messiah came to the world, and yet at the same time, he was, uh, he was, he was killed. He was crucified for our sins. And so, uh, everything was not finished yet. Yes. Also, on the 15th of Av, we're talking the uh, fifth month here, on the 15th of Av is called Tube Av. It is the time of Gula, our redemption. Mm -hmm. And it speaks of grace. And so the month of Av is called Menachem Av, referring to the Comforter, where you remember Jesus said, I go away and I'll send the mm. Comforter. Absolutely. So this fifth millennium, or fifth month, describes the fifth millennium. And with the fifth millennium and the sixth millennium, uh, offers what we call grace, mm. which is uh, most noteworthy as we come to the sixth month. Oh, the sixth month, a beautiful month in the Hebrew calendar. It's called Elul, and Elul <clears throat> can be uh, summarized by, I think, in two basic concepts. One is repentance. Uh, the month Elul, corresponding to the sixth time period, sixth millennium, if you will, is marked by a call to repentance and the extension of the, the Word of God's grace. Mm -hmm. Well, that brings us then down to this uh, sixth month. The sixth month of Elul is a time of grace. Listen to something else here about to be Av. That's the 15th of Av. Mm -hmm. um, Michael Strasfeld writes in the Jewish Holidays, on Tuba Av, the Jews have a tradition that the young ladies dress in white and go out into the fields to dance, and the young men would follow after them." End of quote. Well, you know, with the fifth millennium came 
uh, this time of courtship between the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the bridegroom, and Gentile Christianity, those who believe. We mm -hmm. are the bride of Christ. So you see, every minute ritual observed by the Jews during these months literally tell the story of a prophetic theme that came to pass in the millennium that corresponded to the month. Now let's talk about Moses when we get back and uh, see what he did during the month of Elul. Fascinating story. We'll be back in just a moment. According to Joseph Stern, in his book, The Days of Awe, Moses went up the mountain for the second time on the first day of Elul. Elul is uh, August uh, to September. It's the sixth month of the Jewish calendar. Corresponds to our um, uh, July, or, or that is August, September. Uh, it's the month right before Rosh Hashanah and the High Holy Days in the Jewish calendar. When Moses went up that mountain, they blew, to show, they blew a shofar horn. The second day, they blew another one. The third day, they blew another shofar. And every day throughout the month, they blew the shofar to remind the people that Moses was on top of the mountain and that he would return even though he was temporarily absent. Now, they didn't do this the first 40 days. In fact, if you recall in Exodus 19, when that trumpet sounded, the people were so afraid, they said to Moses, tell God, don't do that again. And so there was no continual trumpet blowing while Moses was on the mountain the first 40 days, which led, of course, to the golden calf. Well, to keep the people pure and, and hopefully anticipating Moses' return, they blew the shofar every day. That has a tremendous prophetic significance. Can you imagine on the second day, they, the people heard the shofar and said, maybe Moses will come back today. Mm. On the third day, they heard the shofar and said, uh, maybe he'll show up today. On the fourth day, and so on it was throughout the month until Moses finally appeared on Tishri 10. That's the imminency doctrine that we have been taught in Christianity mm -hmm. during this dispensation of grace. You may recall when Moses started to go up the mountain, God said, Moses, you have found grace in my sight. And you know, it's, uh, it's interesting, J.R., that here in this uh, sixth month, representing the sixth millennium, uh, the culmination, if you will, in our day of the church mm -hmm. age, <clears throat> we have a doctrine which I believe was laid out by the apostles. I think Paul very clearly taught uh, the imminent return of Christ. <clears throat> that concept was lost until late in the sixth millennium when it began uh, once again to be taught yes. uh, in, in dispensational pre-tribulationism. That is, uh, in, we say perhaps today uh, of Christ, just as the, the Jews said it of Moses. Perhaps today he'll come down the mountain. Yeah, you know, the interesting thing is uh, during the seventh month, this trumpet blowing is accentuated to the people look forward then mm -hmm. from Rosh Hashanah to Yom Kippur. That's a picture of the seventh millennium. And these 10 days from Rosh Hashanah to Yom Kippur picture the tribulation period. Yes, and, you know, I just Before you move on mm -hmm. to, to that tribulation period, uh, you've also noted something that I think that's, that's fantastic, and that is that the month Elul is really a, an acronym. Uh, there is a, yes. a Jewish expression from that Song of Solomon 6.3 where we have the phrase, I am my beloved's and my beloved is mine. In Hebrew, that's four words, ani, ladodi, vadodi, li. And the initials for those four words spell out in Hebrew, elul. And so elul is, uh -huh. the you could say, the month or the millennium of the beloved and wouldn't it be nice if it culminated in the rapture of yeah, the church? The bride and her groom. Isn't that great? <laughs> yeah. Furthermore, nice. you know, Joseph Stern wrote on page 31, according to ancient Jewish tradition, the 12 heavenly constellations correspond to the 12 months of the year. Specifically, the month of Elul is represented by the constellation that resembles a virgin. That's Virgo the virgin. Mm. So here's the bride waiting for her groom. And we can see that in the courtship of the month of Elul approaching Tishri. Also, during the first days of Tishri, God has a battle with Satan. Do you remember during the first 40 days when Moses was on top of the mountain and the people built a golden calf? Well, Satan thwarted God's plan back then. Mm 
He was able to convince the people that Moses was not coming back, and he caused them to build a golden calf. Well, in the, during the second 40-day period, the Jews believe that on the eve of Yom Kippur, that is in the days just preceding Yom Kippur, Satan is trying his best to get the people to again commit sin so that God will not marry Israel. This is a prophetic picture of the tribulation period when the devil will try his last hurrah, his last grand stand, you know, to try to get the world to accept the mark of the beast and mm. to turn against God. You know, J.R., it's been said by uh, many, many expositors uh, down through the years that the book of Revelation is a Jewish book. After the fourth chapter, when the events of the, of the tribulation are underway, Revelation is a Jewish book. And it talks about the chosen. It talks about the elect. And most of all, it talks about this battle in the heavenlies with, uh, in which God's angels are arrayed here and the devil and his angels are arrayed over here. There's a, a war in heaven uh, which very much characterizes the Jewish view of the days of all. Yes. And in our magazine, the January 1998 edition, I've written an article on this subject, and I, I have written this. Following Elul's Days of Grace, the seventh month, Tishri, stands for the days when Satan will try for the last time to keep God's people from becoming a redeemed celestial wife. And Stern writes, Elul is the preparatory period for the battle against Satan on Rosh Hashanah. Mm. And you know, it could be characterized, J.R., as something that the Jews are very fond of expressing. It's not well known in Christian circles, but you could call it a battle between light and darkness, mm -hmm. you know? Yes. And this is the way the Jews characterize uh, this battle. Yes, we're talking about a new world order. We're talking about the Antichrist, the rise of the world government, and the mark of the beast. This is Satan's last final attempt and these first 10 days of Tishri mm. are pictures of the tribulation period. Now the question, and we only have about three minutes left. The mm -hmm. clock is a stern taskmaster. But in this three minutes, J.R., there are 10 days of awe, beginning Tishri 1, running yes. for 10 days. Yes. A and yet the, we, we read of the tribulation period being only seven years. Uh, mm -hmm. Why 10 days of awe if we only have seven years of tribulation? There is a possibility, Gary, that we're looking at 10 years here. Mm. And the last seven would be the tribulation period. And the last right. three and a half of that, the great tribulation period. Right. You recall on Rosh Hashanah, God sets down upon his throne of judgment and takes the scrolls. That's Revelation chapters 4 and 5. Well, the Jews say that God writes the names of the righteous in the book of life. And he writes the names of the wicked in the book of death. But there is an intermediate group that are not totally virtuous nor totally evil, and they have 10 days more in which to straighten up, and they are saved on Yom Kippur. Mm. Well, Gary, this is a picture of, of, uh, of Gentile Christianity. Uh, our names have already been written in the Lamb's Book of Life. We don't have to go through the 10 days. You That's see, right. we're not in that intermediate group. That st stands for a pre-tribulation rapture. It certainly does. And yet the, the, the 10 days could very well be three preparatory years. And we have suggested there is mm -hmm. a, a length of time between the rapture of the church and the beginning of the tribulation. Mm -hmm. and, and those 10 days is probably a subject for a whole other program. Oh, we could easily <laughs> go for a whole program. Yeah. I was going to add that, okay. that the three days are spoken of by uh, Jewish teachers as three days characterized by a, a kind of transcendental quality, if you will, mm -hmm. uh, a quality of highly spiritual nature in which uh, uh, the light of God is called in question. Um, to me, that really does speak of, of a close relationship between uh, the Lord and the redeemed, and it speaks volumes about the rapture of the church. Stern writes on page 270 of his book, as it is well known, the righteous are written in the book of life on Rosh Hashanah. These worthy individuals can be vindicated on the basis of their own merit. They do not need to be saved. It is the intermediate category, the individuals who are neither totally virtuous nor totally evil who are saved on Yom Kippur. Furthermore, he writes that Rosh Hashanah is the day for judging Gentiles. Yom Kippur is strictly Jewish. 
Gary, that says a Gentile Christianity whose names are written in the book of life won't have to go through this world and the tribulation period through to Yom Kippur and the second coming and the <clears throat> salvation of the Jews because we're already saved. We're already saved. And by the way, uh, we're coming close to the end of our time, and I want to repeat that uh, you can find the complete uh, exposition of this concept in the January 1998 Prophecy in the News magazine. Mm -hmm. Gary, it's been an exciting study, and yes. one I think that really means a lot to Christians. Uh, and it means a lot uh, to your friends who have not received Christ because we are now living in that sixth millennium characterized by a lul. Uh, the, I guess we could say that the byword of that month, J.R., is teshuva, repentance. Turn around and, and receive the Lord because the days of awe are coming and there may not be much time. We know the sixth millennium will be ending soon. Soon. And uh, in fact, we don't know exactly what the calendar is, but from all calculations, it could be coming up a few years earlier than the year 2001. Nevertheless, we are so close to the beginning of that millennium. We invite you to trust Christ as your personal Savior. This is J.R. Church and Gary Sherman. Until next time, keep looking up. Prophecy in the News is a viewer-supported ministry sponsored by our many friends across America and in your area. For a free complimentary copy of the magazine, call our offices directly at 1-405-634-1234 or write to Prophecy in the News, P.O. Box 7000, Oklahoma City, Oklahoma, 73153.